Josh Kerr, like Rosie Bertels, like all the <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, nice to have you with us, both those who are here in person at the Blavatnik School and those who are watching online. My name is Dapwa Kande. I'm Professor of International Law here at the Blavatnik School of Government in Oxford. Welcome to this event. It's a book launch, and it's the launch of this book. You have the title in front of you and on your screen. Well, you have part of the title. It's Beyond Imperfect Justice, Legality, and Fair Labeling in International Criminal Law. And this evening, we have the author of the book to present her book. And we have a number of people to discuss the book with her, including, of course, all of you. Author, Dr. Talita Diaz, who is Shaw Foundation Fellow at Jesus College, Oxford and who has also been working as a research fellow here at the Blavatnik School, and in particular at the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict. I'm going to talk a little bit about Talita and talk a little bit about the book, but perhaps I'll start by talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I interviewed for my job here at the Blavatnik School of Government, I said, that one of the proudest things for me in my career is supervising doctoral students and seeing them flourish, and in particular, when they have their books published. I have a, a shelf, uh, part of my bookshelf in my office, which includes the book or the books of uh, supervisees of mine when those books are published. And I said when I interviewed here that that's the proudest part of my bookshelf. And this book, is on that part of my bookshelf because this book originates from a doctoral thesis that Talita completed here in Oxford and which I had the pleasure and the privilege to, to supervise. Miles Jackson is also here and he was examiner of that thesis. He will say a bit more about, about that journey but it really is wonderful to see the progress that is made by a scholar, Talita, came here to Oxford several years ago, Nine, did eight. the eight years, well, eight years, but who's counting, Talita, <laughs> um, did brilliantly on her master's where she won the Clifford uh, Chance Prize as the best student on the MJUR. She then proceeded to writing her doctorate via working for some time at the International Criminal Court has published extensively on international criminal law, including winning prizes along the way for the work that she's written in, in the field. Um, she's won a prize from the Journal of International Criminal Justice, which is the leading journal in that field. And the thesis on which this book is made, uh, based, sorry, also got um, a special mention for the René Casson Prize. So she's an award-winning author, and the book itself is based on an award-winning thesis. It's a book that is of great relevance to the things that are happening in the world today. Um, we have several issues around us that we see, Myanmar, Ukraine, where international criminal justice is central to, to those issues. And the issues that Talita talks about in her book are also central to the application of international criminal justice in, in those circumstances. So it's a book that's 
not only of immediate practical relevance, but it's also a book that's actually theoretically rich as well. That's one of the great contributions of the book. It's a book that is about criminal law theory, but which actually makes quite clear and plain, actually in a way that Talita does very well, writing very clearly about how these things matter and how these things affect the work of the International Criminal Court and, and other courts. So what we're going to do this evening is that, first of all, Talita will very briefly set out the relevance of the book and some of the arguments that she is making in the book. And thereafter, there will then be a discussion um, between Talita and some of the leading scholars um, of international criminal law and international law more generally, uh, discussing amongst themselves and with Talita some of the themes in that book. Uh, Dr. Miles Jackson will moderate that discussion, and I will leave him to introduce the panelists when the time comes. Miles is associate professor of international, well, associate professor of law here at the University of Oxford, and he's a fellow of Jesus College. So let me turn over to Talita, and thereafter we'll turn over to to Miles. Thank you, Apple. So thank you everyone for uh, for making it tonight. It's a real pleasure to be to be here today uh, to talk about uh, this this work, my baby. <laughs> uh, and it's always uh, it's always very nice to see the final product. Uh, and um, you know it's always nice to see the the end of a, of a of a long journey of discovery, self discovery, and you know. Um, development uh, of me as a scholar um, and also um, of the field because a lot has changed since I since I I wrote the book um, and so Dapo as Dapo has uh, mentioned um, the he supervised uh, my my thesis uh, on which uh, the book is based uh, this was in um, this was completed in two thousand and nineteen and. Uh, Miles examined it uh, three times. I'm really sorry <laughs> that he had to go through that uh, so many times, but the feedback was really invaluable. But I wanna talk a little bit about what motivated me, what prompted me to write this book, um, some, a little bit of the background and some of the, the general questions that I had before I actually set out on this journey and also some of the conclusions that I, that I reached towards the end of this project. So actually, um, just a nice anecdote. The book was um, that the research questions that I do within the book were actually prompted uh, during um, a tutorial discussion that I had with Dapo when I was doing my master's here back in 2014. And Dapo had written about this. Uh, it was probably like a paragraph in, a, in an article that that, uh, that he wrote where he raised this question you know, uh, what about these situations um, uh, that uh, come within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, which are, which, or which might be retroactive, right? How does the principle of legality apply to these situations that have been, that come within the, the jurisdiction of the court and are retroactive? Because you have this Rome statute, and then there are a number of provisions about the principle of legality, but then these provisions, which are very specific and very robust, they don't really solve the problem of legality that we have in these retroactive scenarios. So this is how I started to think about those issues. Uh, uh, but actually beyond, uh, beyond the, the tutorial question and the tutorial discussion, which was really interesting, I really tried to sort of like um, address two sort of like dilemmas, one more general and one more specific, uh, facing the project of international criminal justice, uh, and international and the international criminal court more specifically, uh, uh, which which came to mind. And so the first the first dilemma, the more general dilemma that I had is how uh, how can the ICC and other international criminal tribunals end impunity for the most serious uh, atrocities uh, that humanity has ever seen? Right. So crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes, genocide, and, and the crime of aggression, from the Holocaust to the Rwandan genocide, uh, now, and now the situation uh, in Myanmar with the Rohingya, 
in a way that is fair to accused persons. So how can we even start, how can we even begin to think about punishing these perpetrators of the worst atrocities, right? How can we do that in a fair way? Is there a way in which we can do that proportionately and fairly? Um, can, we, can we move away from you know, accusations of uh, show trials at Nuremberg or Victor's justice again at Nuremberg and in some of these uh, post second world war trials, can we think about a way that is a bit more nuanced and, 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 and that seeks to reconcile um, you know, the, 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 the need to end impunity, but also the need to, to treat accused persons in a fair way? So this was the more general dilemma, the more general question that I tried to answer in the book. And the second question and the more specific question that I tried to answer is, is it really fair and perhaps most importantly, even lawful to impose on those persons accused of committing such atrocities, uh, rules of international law or rules of domestic criminal law that are retroactive, that did not apply to the accused at the time when the offense or offenses uh, occurred. Um, is, is, it, is it fair to apply new rules that didn't exist uh, or were more serious than the rules that applied at the time of the conduct to, to, uh, at the time of the conduct to, to past events? So is, is, this, is this fair, is this lawful? So these were the questions that I tried to answer. Um, and then just to take a step back um, in the book, uh, it's also important to, 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 to understand why even ask these questions, right? So why do these questions, why do these dilemmas about fairness, about legality, retroactivity, why do they even matter, right? And so this is the motivation for actually answering these questions that the book uh, seeks to, to, to answer. So the first reason why this question, these questions matter is that, you know, the practice of doing, uh, of, of applying uh, criminal laws in a retroactive way uh, to the detriment of accused persons is not new. So this is something that actually pervades the history of international criminal law. If you look closely at these trials and their judgments from Nuremberg to the Eichmann trial, the Tokyo trial, to the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, as well as the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, as well as the ICC. So there, if you look at these tribunals and their, 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 their cases, there are a number of instances where criminal laws, international, or domestic uh, rules of, of, of criminal law have been applied retroactively. And there are a number of, a number of ways in which this happened, uh, sort of like sometimes it's, it's a little bit covered, sometimes it's really hard to spot the, the retroactivity, but it is there and it really is pervasive. Um, and so, uh, and, and oftentimes these instances of retroactivity, they are justified in the name of pro promoting justice for victims, right? Oh, we need to make sure that vi victims get recognition for what they suffered. We need, we need to ensure, you know, we need to end impunity. We need to ensure justice for them, for the international community. And this is what normally justifies these, these instances of retroactivity. And uh, the second reason why this, this question um, matters is that in the, especially after Nuremberg and in the post-war era, uh, fairness generally, and, in, and most, uh, most importantly, human rights have taken center stage in international law generally and in international law in particular. And so it's a bit hypocritical of international criminal tribunals to be stating that they are, you know, they're trying to, to deliver justice, you know, they're trying to be fair, they're trying to move away from you know, accusations of victor's justice and um, and uh, and and um, show trials that were very common after the Nuremberg trial, and, and and talk about delivering justice when you know they can't be fair to accused persons, right? So this is the other reason why this matters, and um, you know, just like uh, just like the post war uh, World War II trials have often been accused of of lack of impartiality. Um, the, the same thing has, has happened with these trials that we have seen today. So this is a problem that still persists uh, because as I've just said, uh, instances of retroactive application of the criminal law, they continue to occur. Uh, and, yet, and yet the atrocities that uh, you know, international criminal law seeks to punish and, and prevent, they continue to happen. And so we need support for the project of international criminal justice to be able to ensure accountability for these crimes. And so if we don't have 
credible if we don't have institutions, uh, international and domestic criminal courts that are that have legitimacy, that are credible, that, that have the trust of the international community, then we won't be able to move this project forward. So this is why it matters, right? So we need support for the project, but without, without ensuring fairness for accused persons, then the project won't have the credibility that it needs to move forward. So these are the, the three main reasons why, why this question matters. So just to give a little bit more, um, sort of like just to give you one concrete example of how this, how, how this plays out in practice and why all of these questions, all of these issues matter in, in the real world, um, take the situation of, of Ukraine, for example, which is uh, unfolding right now as we speak. So there's a war happening right now, a war that started in arguably in 2014 with the invasion of Crimea, right? And in the case of Ukraine, um, so um, Ukraine is not, uh, the situation is now before the International Criminal Court. So the, the prosecutor of the ICC is investigating the situation. The official investigation has started um, and uh, it has been under examination, preliminary examination since uh, April uh, 2014 when this declaration uh, was made. So this is a declaration by um, the government of Ukraine that accepted the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court for the situation of Ukraine. So why this declaration? Why did, why did Ukraine have to go through the trouble of making this declaration? Well, Ukraine is not a party to the statute of the ICC. And so the only way in which the ICC could hear the case was through uh, either a referral by the United Nations Security Council or uh, one of these declarations whereby a state that is not party to the ICC uh, accepts the jurisdiction of the ICC for a specific situation. And so Ukraine initially made one declaration in April two, uh, of 2014, referring to the ICC uh, uh, events that occurred in the territory of Ukraine between November of 2013 and 2014. Does anyone know what happened then at that time? November, 2013, say again? No one? Wagner Group did something. <laughs> so it was actually the maiden events. So this was this is actually like the trigger for the war that we are seeing right now. So it all started here. Actually, the maiden events, so the maiden uh, uh, uprising and the maiden revolution. So a series of protests that took place in the Independence Square. That's the name of the square in Ukrainian maiden square in Kiev. Uh, um, and they took place following the refusal by the then president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, to sign an association agreement with the EU. So people in Ukraine got upset because the president didn't want to sign this agreement with the EU, and they, they went uh, to the streets to protest. There were serious clashes with the police between protesters and police. More than 100 people died. Uh, several people were injured uh, and they led to the ousting of the president later on. And that is what led to anti uh, uh, maiden and pro Russian protests in Crimea and in the Donbas region, which then justified the Russian invasion in Crimea and in the Donbas. So, this is what happened. Uh, and so, uh, the government of Ukraine at the time thought that this amounted to crimes against humanity, hence, the declaration referring the case to the ICC. And then we all know what happened afterwards, as I've mentioned, the invasion of Crimea, the occupation of uh, Donbas uh, and, and Crimea. And then because of that, uh, prompted by these events, uh, again, the government of Ukraine made another declaration, uh, this time in September of 2015, referring uh, to the ICC events that took place since February 2014. So look at the date. So we have here, a, a declaration that was made in 2014 uh, with respect to events that took place in 2013 and 2014. And then another declaration from 2015 uh, referring to events that took place since February, 2014. So as you can see, these declarations are partly retroactive, meaning that they include or they cover events that took place before the date of the declaration. And so the question is, because Ukraine was not a party to the statute of the ICC, the crimes that are in the statute of the ICC don't apply or didn't apply to Ukraine at that time, right? Uh, and so 
can the ICC really apply these crimes to the individuals that were involved in, in this situation? Uh, potential perpetrators of crimes, serious crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and even genocide. Could the ICC apply uh, these uh, provisions, the crimes within the statute of the ICC without violating the principle of legality, without breaching fundamental principles of, of, of fairness and, and criminal law? Um, and so that's the question, that's one of the questions that the book uh, seeks to tackle, right? If, if it's fair and if it's lawful for the ICC to be applying, applying um, the Rome statute to situations like Ukraine, including what happened after the invasion um, in 2022, because according to some scholars, even these declaration, even after uh, February, 2014, um, even for events following the declaration, uh, the statute could not be applicable to Ukraine because a declaration such as this one cannot apply the Rome statute. So for some scholars, these kinds of declarations cannot even up, up, have the effect of applying the Rome statute to accused persons. So this is a very practical issue, the issue of retroactivity or, or retroactive application of the Rome statute uh, that is uh, coming up very soon, probably before the ICC, once the prosecutor uh, completes the, the, the investigation. Um, and so um, a lot of people might say, well, actually, uh, the crimes in question, you know, war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, uh, and perhaps genocide, not aggression, because aggression does not come within uh, this, this situation because of the different sort of like conditions for the ICC to exercise jurisdiction over, over aggression. But a lot of people might say, uh, legitimately ask, well, these crimes existed under customary international law or, uh, or treaties uh, at that time, right? So, you know, there's no question that accused persons uh, were, were bound by the Rome Statute and had notice of, of, of these crimes. Uh, but actually, the important point here is that the definitions and the labels of crimes, of the, some of these crimes in the Rome Statute, they are not exactly the same as the ones that applied under customary international law and under treaties. So for example, torch, the crime against humanity of torture, the crime of rape, uh, the mode of liability of command responsibility, there are some specific sexual offenses, uh, some types of persecution, all of these offenses which are relevant in this and other cases are not exactly the same as between the Rome Statute and, and customary international law. And so if the ICC applies these crimes and other uh, rules of criminal law that differ from uh, the, the, the law that applied at the time of, of the events, then uh, the principle of legality might be, uh, might be violated. And, and, and we don't want that to happen if we want the international community to continue to support um, the ICC's investigation in Ukraine. So just in a nutshell, what does my book say about this um, and similar situations? So it shows that uh, there are a lot of overlooked ways in which uh, international and domestic courts have applied international, rules of international and domestic law retroactively and this might potentially breach one of the most fundamental principle of, principles of criminal law, which is the principle of, of legality, which I've just mentioned. Um, and uh, the, the book also, also um, shows that the principle of legality, it really does an in-depth survey of the history of the principle of legality and non or the principle of non-retroactivity and tries to understand what this principle is about and what is the scope of this principle today uh, from Nuremberg to, 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 the, to the present day. And it finds that actually the principle is not just about defining crimes and penalties uh, with specificity. It's not just about that. It's not only about uh, applying crimes and, and penalties uh, in a non-retroactive way, but it also includes all rules of criminal law that would have a detrimental effect, that would have a, ne a negative effect on the human rights of the accused. So this is one of the key conclusions of the principle to kind of like set the record straight about what the principle of legality is about. Principle of legality, as I've said earlier, is one of the most fundamental principles of criminal law because it protects individuals from uh, the arbitrary imposition of the criminal law. So if we don't have notice of the criminal law, then we can't behave, we can't really foresee the consequences of our conduct. And so we can't behave accordingly. So it protects individual freedom from state 
arbitrariness. So this is this is an important principle. And the other principle that the book uh, deals with is fair labeling. And so this is a very overlooked principle of criminal law because it started in English um, English criminal law scholarship, but actually a lot of uh, international criminal courts and tribunals and and, and scholars are are, are um, gradually. Uh, are increasingly referring to this principle more often, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, inconsistency as to what this principle means, what it is about, and so I decided uh, as well to to set the record straight because this principle is also relevant, um, and it is relevant because labels matter in international criminal law, right? And they matter because without labels, international criminal law can't really communicate the wrongfulness of these atrocities. Imagine if we call genocide oh, just killing. It wouldn't have the same effect, right? Uh, if we called crimes against humanity just um, regular murder or regular rape, it wouldn't have the same effect, right? So without these labels, international criminal law wouldn't have the same effect. Um, and so the idea, uh, so the book really delves deep into what this principle is, what it is about, what its, uh, its legal basis in international law, and it, and it concludes that the principle not only overlaps with legality, the principle of legality, but it also is a self-standing principle of, of criminal law uh, that, that matters and should be taken into account. Um, and just to conclude, um, there is a case before the ICT where uh, uh, these very issues arose very recently, about a year ago, the Abdul Al Rahman case or Ali Kushaib, which relates to the situation in Sudan, uh, Darfur, Sudan. Uh, this man was a leader of the Janjaweed militia in Sudan, and he was accused. He has he has been accused of committing crimes against humanity, war crimes, in in Darfur. And um, his defense challenged the jurisdiction of the ICC, arguing that some of his charges were retroactive. And the ICC actually uh, adopted some of the, the proposals of my book, which is to not simply ignore the, 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 the issue of retroactivity, but actually assess whether the, cha the, the charges against the accused um, uh, matched uh, uh, prior laws, applicable laws under customary international law. And this is important because, again, like Ukraine, Sudan is not a party to the ICC statute and the situation was referred uh, by the Security Council. So the Rome statute did not apply to Sudan. It, it didn't apply to the accused. So this is why the, the, these questions matter. Um, and um, again, just, just to sum up, um, if, uh, if the ICC really wants to, to make sure that it's not accused of you know, delivering imperfect justice, distant justice, or justice that is imposed by Western countries, uh, um, on African countries or developing countries, it needs to make sure that it's applying fair criminal laws to everyone. Uh, and sometimes this means looking at uh, other sources of international law rather than its own statute. So this is in a nutshell what the book does, uh, and I'm happy to take questions and to get the discussion uh, going. Thank you. Thanks very much to Lisa and to Dato and to BSG. I'm really very happy to be here on what is a celebratory evening, celebration of a book. So I want to use the start of my time to say a little bit about what it was to be on the other side of the desk as the assessor across this project. As Tlita said, I acted as the qualifying test assessor in July 2017, as the assessor at confirmation in November 2018, and then as final examiner in December of 2019. And so prepping for today, I went back and read our reports across those three stages, just to remind myself of, of what we talked about and the evolution of the project. So three things struck me across my, our reports. So first, just the constant repetition of the high scholarly standard of the work. Rich sourcing, even-handed treatment of material, careful argument. That is something you'll see immediately if you pick up the monograph. Second, reading back through the reports made me reflect a little bit about the process of writing a doctorate, and particularly the non-linear process. Reading the transfer report from 2017, in reading that report, one sentence jumped out at me, and it was this sentence, a little bit pretentious, but 
in a general sense, it seemed to us that the timetable for completion of the doctorate was too ambitious and the scope and coverage of the research question were not ambitious enough. So I imagine at the time that was not a particularly welcome thing to receive in a report. So what we were really trying to convey is that the narrowness of the question as it was, was insufficiently ambitious to do justice to Chica's research talent. And then third and finally looking to our report from 2019, and now at the book, I'm struck by where Talita's re reflection and revision and work ended up. So what you see in this book is at the same time, a theoretically informed, doctrinally strong and practically useful book. That's a trilogy that's extremely difficult to pull off all while making a contribution to certain fundamental questions, legality, fair labeling, fairness. And of course, alongside the evolution of a project, you get the evolution and development of a person from student to graduate researcher to co-teacher and now to colleague. And that's one of the most gratifying things about being an academic. So that's something of the book and the project. I would like to now introduce our two panelists and then we'll, they will kick off and we'll have some questions. So first we have Professor Kevin Heller. Professor of International Law and Security at the, at the Center for Military Studies at the University of Copenhagen, as well as a professor of law at ANU. Kevin has written on a range of topics in international law, as well as social theory, I would see in Kevin, including an absolutely groundbreaking book on the Nuremberg Military Tribunals and the origins of international criminal law. And second, I'd like to welcome Davika Havel, who's an associate professor of law, public international law at the LSE. She has also published widely on topics in international law, including her monograph on due process in the Security Council, her piece on the authority of universal jurisdiction, which I'm about to teach next week, <laughs> and her just published current legal problems lecture on the elements of international legal positivism. So we'll start, Tavika, with you, who will, you'll give some short reflections and a question, and then we'll move to Kevin, who will really lead on questioning. Tavika. Hi, thanks, Miles. Hello to everybody. I'm sorry not to be there tonight. Talita, congratulations. What a wonderful achievement. And how lovely uh, to be able to join you to celebrate uh, this achievement. Um, We've heard from Talita, and I don't know how she did it, packed into uh, several minutes, uh, a, a whistle-stop tour via um, some important points in her thesis, uh, her treatise. Um, I could just sit here and praise you. I, you've taken me on such a ride. I've so enjoyed engaging with the book, um, and you have made me think, and I think that's the greatest <laughs> praise uh, one can give a book. So as a result, I'm not going to just sit here and praise. I, I have some definite questions for you. Now, forgive me, Miles, I, I, am, I can see you. Let me know when my comment uh, should become a question. I am, I am asking a question, but in the very worst model uh, of questions, I'm going to start with a few comments. So, Talita, I just want to, to, to set up for, for, the, for the room that I can't sadly see uh, just, you know, what uh, Talita has done because she gave us a very persuasive presentation there. But at the heart of this thesis, I find there's a very controversial claim and it is certainly one that she backs up. And so I am going to try at some st stage to share a slide because I think sort of uh, immersed in Talita's description of what she's done uh, was this discussion of how she is interpreting the principle of legality. And I think that principle of legality uh, that she sets out is an expansive interpretation of that principle. And, and I want to set up for everyone because this is where actually uh, the rubber really hits the road with, with her treatise, uh, this interpretation. And, and I, I need to, to show you, I think, uh, how she's expanded that interpretation. So if I might, a brief sharing of screen, 
quite awkwardly done. Uh, all I want to show you is really Article 15 of, of the ICPR, which many of you may not have memorised. Uh, Talita, I'm sure, has. So we'll see that the principle of legality uh, actually sets up uh, that no one shall be held guilty of any criminal offence on account of any act or omission which did not constitute a criminal offence under national or international law at the time when it was committed, and nor shall a heavier penalty be imposed. So really, the principle of legality under Article 15, which as Talisa acknowledges, this is the blueprint of the principle of legality, really only attaches to the act or omission not being a criminal offence under national or international law and to the penalty. As Talita interprets it, uh, she, she, I'd argue, expands this uh, to aspects beyond uh, the criminality of the offence and includes in that, and I'm quoting from her book, the material and mental elements of the crime, modes of liability, defences, penalties, conditions of punishment and prosecution, and any other rule that may have a substantive impact on the right of the individual, including in some instances, criminal labels. So let me stop my sharing there. My question to you is, Talita, do you worry that we're not yet ready for such an expansive principle of legality in the international sphere? So hear me out. My question is whether the principle of legality should be of a differential standard depending on the level of development of the legal system. We're currently in a formative phase, I'd argue, still of international criminal law. And so this field of international criminal justice is one that invites innovation. And there's something about international criminal law that excites our utopian passions, that's for sure. Um, so international law is full of Groschen moments and none more so than international criminal law. Uh, which we really constantly struggle to bring into line with these global Grund norms that temper the excesses of a strictly technical positivist approach to the law, uh, where we have to wait for that extensive and virtually uniform state practice called for by the North Sea Continental Shelf case. So the argument is actually that international criminal law requires a slightly different standard that, let's say, maritime boundary delimitation. And that the cautious judge respecting positive law and applying an expansive principle of legality is not the sort of heroic figure we seek in the narrative of the, of the progress of international criminal law. So we're still in a situation where international criminal law suffers from a dearth of jurisprudence um, and where we're building the elementary architecture of international crimes. So my question is whether the principle of legality cannot apply to the international field as it does say in a domestic criminal context. And certainly I'm not the first one to, to ask this question or propose uh, such a thing. Uh, if we go back to the justice trial of 1947, uh, the court there argued that to have applied the principle of legality to judicial decisions of common international law would have been to strangle that law at birth. You in your book cite approvingly Judge Schomburg's dissenting opinion in Gallich, uh, where he dissented from the majority's uh, expansion or, or extension uh, to the accused of the crime of inflicting terror upon civilians uh, because it wasn't beyond doubt that that was part of customary international law at the time. I'm wondering though, whether actually we shouldn't prefer the European Court of Human Rights interpretation uh, of that principle of legality. Uh, the argument that this actually should include, that the principle of legality does include the evolutionary adaptation of norms. Um, but I suppose, you know, the question then becomes, when does that sort of evolutionary or human rights loophole uh, become the black hole for law. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop my comment there and hope that you found the questions within it. Great, thanks, Tavika. I think we'll take Kevin and then we yeah, can choose. Yeah. Kevin, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Miles. Um, so first off, I'm, I'm very honored to be here tonight, particularly in such august company. Um, 
but I have to confess that this is the kind of the most most difficult kind of book launch for me, because um, normally I, I like a book, but you know, being a contrarian, have reservations about some, if not many, of its arguments. So then I can kind of spin my reservations into into hopefully something interesting to say about the book. Um, my problem tonight is that apparently unlike my my friend Davika, um, I agree with nearly every word <laughs> that Talita has written in this book, um, something that is very rare for me and, and probably should be very worrying for Talita. Um, <laughs> so the, I, I think Beyond Imperfect Justice is really the definitive account of retroactivity, legality, and fair labeling in international law, one that will be cited for as long as ICL continues to exist. Um, and that's another uh, topic for another day. Um, and I think that's no small feat. And we should really appreciate just how incredibly difficult <laughs> most of the issues are that she takes on in not just this book, but in her doctoral dissertation. Um, many scholars have tried <laughs> to cover these topics and have done so with much less aplomb than Talita has. Um, so I, like, I joined Devika in congratulating you on this accomplishment. Um, so there's only one thing I disagree with Talita about, uh, and that's about whether state parties can uh, accept the, well, non-state parties can accept the jurisdiction of the court concerning aggression via an ad hoc declaration. Um, she believes they can. I believe they can't. Um, that's a narrow issue, and, and I don't think it's particularly interesting unless you're really a Rome statute nerd. Um, so what I want to propose- That's the right room, Kevin. No, oh, okay, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but what I propose to do instead is I'd like to ask her a few questions about two issues that she addresses in her book uh, that are near and dear to my heart. Um, the first is the legal recharacterization of facts pursuant to ICC Regulation 55. And the second is what limits exist, if any, on the application of Article 21.3 of the Rome Statute. Um, so let me start with legal recharacterization of facts. Uh, if you look at the ICC practice, and I should say that I'm speaking in my academic capacity and not as a special advisor to the prosecutor, um, at the ICC, the Office of the Prosecutor has very aggressively used Regulation 55, which permits such recharacterization. Uh, in particular, beginning with the Rudo and Kenyatta cases, the OTP has consistently charged defendants with one mode of participation and then asked or invited the trial chamber to consider convicting them of any of the modes of participation in Article 25.3, regardless of whether they were initially charged or even regardless of whether the defendant addressed them in his case in chief. And that practice has been approved by the trial chamber. Now, I've argued elsewhere that there's lots of fair trial problems <laughs> with that practice, but I also wonder whether the legal recharacterization re of facts raises issues concerning the relationship between legality and fair labeling. Um, what makes asking the, the question difficult is that the ICC's judges have not settled on a consistent position concerning whether the modes of participation in Article 25.3 actually form a hierarchy, hierarchy of seriousness, with commission being the most serious contribution to a group crime the least serious. Some judges believe that they do form a hierarchy. Others, most recently, Judges Morrison and Aboe Yasuji, insist that they do not. So here are my kind of three interrelated questions on legal recharacterizations for Toledo. And I apologize for asking like, you know, something with 27 sub questions, but um, you're smart, you can handle it. Um, so if the modes of participation in Article 25.3 do form a hierarchy of seriousness, does that mean that recharacterizing the defendant's mode of participation after trial would violate legality if it involved moving kind of, quote, up the hierarchy? Second question is then the converse. If the modes of participation do not form a hierarchy, does that mean that the only limit on the recharacterization of facts under Regulation 55 is in fact the right to a fair trial? Or does legality and or fair labeling still have something to say? And then finally, and I think this is the most interesting question here, uh, what about situations in which legality and fair labeling collide? Namely, a situation in which legally recharacterizing facts will expand the accused culpability, but the resulting recharacterization is a much more accurate label for the defendant's culpability. In other words, what about situations in which the OTP has done a poor, jar, poor job of charging the defendant, but the defendant is in fact guilty? What should the court do then? So that's the first issue. Then much more briefly on the second issue, I wanna to ask Talita a couple of, well, one question about Article 21.3 of the Rome Statute. Uh, this article stipulates that the ICC must interpret and apply all law in a manner consistent with internationally recognized human rights. Here too, 
I find Talita's argument concerning how the articles affect the principles of legality and fair labeling completely convincing. But I'm wondering how far she thinks Article 21.3's ability to displace Rome statute provisions actually goes. Um, and here I'll mention two examples from Judge Ibanez Carranza. Uh, she's argued that the pretrial chamber should be able to review any decision by the Office of the Prosecutor not to open an investigation, even declina declinations that are not based on the interests of justice, which is in fact the only situation specifically covered by Article 53.3b of the Rome Statute. And in her view, the power of review going beyond the Rome Statute is demanded by the rights of victims that Article 21.3 requires the court to take into account. Similarly, and relatedly, because both of these come out of the Afghanistan situation, Judge Ibanez Carranza has argued that Article 21.3 gives victims the right to appeal a decision not to investigate, despite them not qualifying under Article 82.1 as a party with regard to decisions on jurisdiction and admissibility. So my question to you is a pretty simple one. Do you agree with those decisions, one or both? And if so, why? And if not, why not? I'm very curious because your robust interpretation of Article 21.3 makes perfect sense to me in the context of what you're talking about, but yeah. scares me in a whole number of other contexts in which Article 21.3 has been invoked as a kind of trump card to just yeah. simply rewrite the Rome Statute. So I will end with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kevin. Tlita, over to you. No, thank you so much for all these questions and comments. Um, it, it's, it's, always, it's always good to see how, you know, uh, how many different questions the book has sort of like ignited, um, you know, for different people. So um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to actually read the book. Um, I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm really grateful to have you, you both here. So I'll start with Davika's uh, comments, uh, remarks, uh, points. Um, and so I think that um, the first thing that I would say in response uh, to Davika is that um, I think international criminal law is ready for a more robust formulation of the principle of legality. I think we have moved beyond the stage where legality was just a principle of justice, uh, where you know, judges had, or, or we didn't have sufficient rules or sufficient, sufficient laws, sufficient uh, definitions of crimes and definitions of modes of liability, such as when the ICTY started uh, back in the 1990s, we have moved beyond that stage to a stage where with the case law of the two ad hoc tribunals, with the case law of the International Criminal Court, with the case law of other um, hybrid and internationalized tribunals, we have reached a point where uh, of no return, really. A point where we have a sufficient body of laws under customary international law, as well as specific treaties. And we also have, for example, the ICRC study on customary international law uh, for uh, international humanitarian law, which also sort of like um, lays down definitions of crimes, of war crimes. Uh, and so we already have a sufficient corpus, a sufficient body of laws and interpretations, case law that allows us to uh, not rely so much on judicial creativity to develop the law, right? So that, that is what I think. Um, and I also think that, um, the, the even before we reached this stage when we needed a little bit, when, when judges actually needed to be a little bit more creative, you know, you talked about the Grotian, a Grotian moment of, of international criminal law, even at that time, and I think, and I, when I think about that time, I think of uh, Judge Antonio Cassazzi and his many decisions at the ICTY um, uh, and also the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, when we had some questionable modes of liability, some questionable findings about uh, different rules of, of, of international criminal law, uh, the definition of rape, for example, joint criminal enterprise, um, the crime of uh, terrorism, uh, for example. So I think that even at that stage, at that earlier stage, when we didn't have as much uh, case law as we have now, I'd say that the, the shortcomings of issuing such kind of decision outweigh the benefits of judicial creativity. 
uh, not, sorry, that's my my watch. I think that um, <laughs> I think that um, you know we we've seen a lot of backlash, especially you know uh, in subsequent uh, in subsequent decisions of the ICTY itself and other criminal tribunals uh, uh, with respect to those uh, decisions. And I think that ha that has significant that backlash has significantly undermined the credibility of the ICTY, for example. So I think that maybe at one point it was important to do so, but then subsequently the, the, the example that those kinds of de decisions set wasn't really good overall. It, they didn't really, uh, they didn't do much good, I, I would say, to the project of international criminal justice as a whole, as, as a normative, as a, as a policy argument. Um, so these are all normative considerations. On the doctrinal, on, on, on the more doctrinal sort of like level, I think that, you know, if you look at the, um, the formulations, the different formulations of the principle of legality at the universal in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, also in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and other regional and international treaties, the American Convention on Human Rights. And if you look at the case law of different human rights bodies, including the European Court of Human Rights, uh, and separately from the jurisprudence of the international uh, criminal tribunals that I have referred to, if you look at that case law, you can see that the principle actually grew in scope over, over time, you know, and it grew not just at the international level, but it grew also at the, dom at the domestic level. Um, and, and, and it grew because uh, of precisely the reasons that I've just mentioned. Uh, Different, different, in different domestic legal systems and in different international courts and tribunals, you know, the, 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 the conclusion was reached that it was not fair. It was not fair to do that, to, to apply laws that were not foreseeable, were not accessible and foreseeable to accused persons. You've mentioned the, the standard uh, that the European Court of Human Rights came up with to apply the, the principle of legality. I, I, I generally agree with that standard. I think it's a fair, I think in, 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 in sort of like at a general level, the standard that the European Court of Human Rights came up with is, is, a, is a reasonable one. And that standard really measures whether or not legality is complied with by assessing whether or not a certain rule of criminal law is accessible and foreseeable to, to an accused person, taking into account judicial developments and also taking into account whether or not a hypothetical a hypothetical lawyer would have been able to advise the accused about that judicial development, right, or or, or legal development. I think, uh, you know, in general, that 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 standard is is fine. The problem that I have with that standard is that first, um, it's a bit too general to to cover all ways in which rules of criminal law can be applied retroactively. So the problem is, and this is something that I, I, I really uh, address in the book that I really tried uh, to pin down in the book was the way, the, the, the pervasive, the, the, the secretive uh, uh, ways in which uh, different rules of criminal law were, were played with or, or replaced or mixed and matched, right? And so it wasn't really evident. It wasn't really clear that there was a problem of retroactivity. So for example, uh, we apply a crime uh, that uh, didn't uh, that that wasn't binding on the accused, but you know it was similar enough to that crime that was applicable to the accused, uh, and so that is enough, right? And so that is enough uh, to to satisfy the accessibility and foreseeability of the criminal law. But then what happens is there there are a number of other aspects of the criminal law that matter for criminal responsibility. An individual cannot be held responsible for having committed an offense if they are entitled to a defense that excludes criminal liability. So you can't really, you can't really consider a criminal responsibility without looking at defenses. You can't really consider criminal responsibility without looking at modes of liability. You need to look at the full set of rules of criminal law that apply, which make up criminal responsibility, right? And I think that from the beginning of the, the jurisprudence of uh, the European Court of Human Rights and other human rights, but it, this, this was quite clear. Right. The problem is that different domestic and international courts were, do, were, were applying these different elements retroactively in a covert way. Right. They were simply overlooking these different elements. And so the problem of retroactivity wasn't really evident. 
And so this is what I tried. It was this covertness, these pervasive covert practices of applying criminal laws retroactively that I tried to address in the book, that I tried to unpack in the book. So, um, and the other problem that I have with the standard uh, of the European court is that it, it, it introduces this hypothetical lawyer kind of standard. So uh, on your point about judicial interpretation, I don't think that judicial interpretation in itself it goes against the principle of legality. I think that there's room for interpretation, right? Any law, including criminal law is ambiguous, right? And so there's always room, there's always margin for, for interpretation. We, 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 we will always need a judge to interpret a law, a criminal law or a non-criminal law, right? The problem is when you, know, you go beyond what is acceptable, what, you go beyond what the text, what the context, what the object and purpose, right? And what other principles of interpretation would require a judge to do when interpreting a rule of criminal law. So I don't think that judicial interpretation is inherently contrary to the principle, but of course it has limits to it, right? And more stringent limits than uh, a, a regular rule of international law would have, because you're talking about an accused, an individual, right? You're talking about applying very serious consequences, very serious criminal sanctions, life in prison even uh, to individuals. And so you need to consider you know, their human rights, their human rights to, to not have um, retroactive criminal laws imposed on them. Um, so, I, and also like on the hypothetical lawyer standard, I think that is a little bit unfair because it doesn't take into account the fact that individuals in these different parts of the world don't have access to, to lawyers, right? And so if, if the bar is set, you know, at the level of what a lawyer would have understood, then this is not realistic for individuals in different parts of the world who don't have access to such a, such a lawyer. So this is my, those are my, my concerns with the European standard, but in general, I think it's a, it's a, the accessibility and foreseeability test is, 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 a, is, a, is a reasonable one. So on Kevin's point about um, legal recharacterization of facts. So for those who are not familiar, and I'll just repeat it. So legal recharacterization of facts happens when, you know, you have, you, you qualify um, a certain conduct with a certain crime or a certain mode of liability. And then as the trial proceeds, as the trial uh, moves forward, then the judges or the prosecutor before, uh, before uh, the case moves on to trial, the prosecutor actually changes their mind and, and, and decides to actually charge the individual with other crimes or other modes of liability. So that, as Kevin said, this happens very, uh, th this has happened in a few cases before the ICC. Uh, so uh, in terms of like um, whether this would go against the principle of legality, as I argue in the book, I don't think that legal recharacterization of facts um, is problematic in terms of legality. I don't think that it raises problems of legality just because you're not talking about um, applying laws that were not binding on the accused at the time of the offense, right? So you're talking about mixing and matching or replacing laws, substituting criminal laws that were all applicable to the accused at the time of the offense. So I don't see a problem of retroactivity or legality there, right? My problem with this practice is, fair lab is, is that it might go against fair labeling. Right, and because fair labeling requires the you know prosecutors and judges to apply labels that represent that are reflective of the accused's uh, wrongdoing, criminality, the deg degree of criminality. Now, the the the, the question of hierarchy uh, between modes of liability, so whether or not you know moving from a lower kind of like mode of liability to a higher one or vice versa, whether that would go against fair labeling. My answer is it depends. It really depends because fair labeling, as I argue in the book, doesn't really say, oh, you need to go for a more um, sort of like a hierarchically superior mode of liability or a hierarchically inferior mode of liability. What fair labeling is about is choosing the mode of liability and the crime and the defense that fits the most with the conduct, right? And so this could be a, 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 a mode of liability that is hierarchically more serious, such as principle. Uh, perpetration, or it could go, or it could be going for uh, a, a lower kind of tier 
uh, mode of liability, such as aiding and abetting. The hierarchy really doesn't matter. What matters is that one choose and also the level of specificity. So, for example, uh, going for a more specific mode of liability, such as co-perpetration through an organization, moving from that to a more general one, such as aiding and abetting. I don't see that as problematic or as going against fair labeling insofar as, you know, taking into account the conduct or the degree of participation of the accused that fits best, that is more appropriate to capture the conduct of the accused. So I don't see, I don't see the hierarchy posing a problem of, of, of fair labeling necessarily, but it will depend on, on the facts of the case. Of course, there might be a problem of fair trial, right? It might, there might be a problem of not providing the accused with sufficient notice that the mode of liability that they ended up being charged with is more serious than the one that they were originally charged with. And that is a problem of fairness, which is separate to the problem of fair labeling, right? Because fair labeling is about choosing the right label, right? And then there's the aspect of legality, which is about applying a label that was applicable to the accused at the time of the offense. But the issue of choosing a label that is more serious than the one that was originally, um, than the one with which the accused was originally charged, that is a problem of, of a fair trial, I would say. Now, on the point about Article 21.3 uh, of the Rome Statute, which is about applying the, the, an obligation of the court to apply internationally recognized human rights, to give primacy to internationally recognized human rights. Uh, as I argue in the book, I think that this provision allows and even requires the ICC to displace provisions of the Rome Statute that violate, that, that, that are inconsistent with internationally recognized human rights, right? And I argue in the book that these human rights have to be uh, grounded in at least a source of law that the International Criminal Court is competent to apply. And these are uh, customary international law, international treaties that are binding on the, on the states that are parties to the ICC statute, uh, and general principles of law. And I argue that only, um, only human rights that are binding on states parties uh, are applicable before the ICC because otherwise you would end up applying regional human rights treaties, say, let's say the European Convention on Human Rights to states that are not parties to that treaty, right? For example, Brazil is not a party to the European Convention on Human Rights. And so uh, applying the European Convention uh, on Human Rights uh, um, before the ICC would mean that Brazil would be bound by, through the back door, Brazil would be bound by that convention through the back door. And I don't think that this is the object, I don't think that this is the aim of that provision. So this is what I argue in the book. Now on your question about Judge Ivania's um, proposition that uh, victims have a right to appeal uh, in these particular situations, um, I would I would disagree with her. <laughs> My and the short answer is I don't think that uh, that this approach is correct, and I don't think that this is what my approach would allow a judge to do. Simply because I don't think that in those cases, in those situations um, that you've mentioned, there was a, a lacuna or a gap in the Rome Statute. Right? I don't think that if you read the Rome Statute. If you read the text, if you read the object and purpose, if you read it in context, uh, I don't think that the aim of the Rome Statute was to provide victims with such extensive rights of appeal. Because the whole point of the Rome Statute when providing for victim participation was to recognize their interests, but not to give them the same rights as a party would have, right? So this is what the Rome Statute um, does when it recognizes participation rights of victims. So I don't think that there is a gap in the Rome Statute that requires uh, one to be filling with uh, internationally recognized human rights. So this would be my response to, to, to your question. So I don't, I don't think that, yes. Kevin. This is just a really brief follow-up. So you, you opened your answer by saying that you believe that Article 21.3 in your context can displace yeah. provisions of the Rome Statute. And now you say that the victim's rights aren't applicable because there's no lacuna, but you can't displace a lacuna. You can only displace a different norm or a different provision. So right. what is the, the provision in the Rome Statute 
Or what, what's the lacuna or the gap in the Rome statute that allows 21.3 to bring in legality, fair labeling, things like that? So that's a good point. So uh, in the case of legality, uh, the, the, there is no lacuna. So that's the thing. So in the case of legality, what we have is an inconsistency, right? We have an inconsistency with the human right. And so that's why we have, uh, we, need to, we need to resolve the norm conflict. So we have an inconsistency between the Rome statute and the principle of legality as it applies uh, else, as, it, as it's recognized in uh, human rights treaties. And you resolve that inconsistency by giving primacy to internationally recognized human rights, right? So that's how you resolve. In that case, I think it's a little bit different, the kind of situation, because we don't really have, we don't really have an inconsistency between the Rome statute and, and what other human rights treaties uh, would say, right? I don't think that happens so that we reach a point where we need to resolve an, a conflict, right? And a conflict only arises, a, a com for a conflict to arise, that depends on how we interpret the provisions, right? So it depends on how one interprets the Rome statute itself. And so I don't think that the Rome statute by not granting victim participations at that stage would be in conflict with human rights treaties. So that would be sort of like the, 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 the a preliminary point, right? So before the gap, there the, the would have, there would, the, the, I, I would say one would have to find an inconsistency. And if there's no inconsistency, then only if there is a gap, one should look at other sources of international uh, law. But I don't think that reading the Rome statute there's either a gap or an inconsistency that justifies exporting human rights treaties into the Rome statute. I don't know if that, that makes sense. So I don't think first and foremost, I should have said that first. I don't think that first and foremost, there's an inconsistency and then there's no gap justifying the application of customary international law and, and other sources of law to fill any lacuna. So I don't think, yeah, so that, that, that would be my answer. So I don't think it should be concerned about this, the, the, the extent of Article 21.3 uh, because, but at the end of the day, it all depends on how one interprets the provisions, right? Uh, so there's always, the, there's always that danger, which is inherent to any international criminal trial or uh, tribunal, right? Uh, because, yeah. Davika, I wonder if you want to come back and if not, I'll take a few questions from the audience. I, I could, but I, Miles, I'm conscious that, that there's a QA, and a a question in the Q&A and also uh, the audience. So perhaps I'll, I'll yeah, leave it until uh, it, there's a lacuna. But, <laughs> so from the audience in the room, I'll take a couple and I'll also check online. And please just say who you are before you. Thanks, uh, Richard. I'm also a postdoc, not a Blavatnik, at the Bonavero Institute. And um, congratulations on the book. Mine's more of a bird's eye view sort of question, like based on what uh, Devika was saying about international criminal law being in its formative stages. And I've got the impression that Kevin thinks maybe the future of international criminal law might be a bit hazy. And I'm just wondering, do you feel positive about the future of international criminal law, like through international machinery like the ICC, or do you see it more through domestic avenues or both? Or are you feeling a bit depressed about the state of international criminal law and its future? <laughs> Let me take, so there's two online. Yeah. Thanks very much. So first, uh, Jessica Corsi says, thank you for a great discussion regarding the statement that the recharacterization of facts might violate fair labeling, but not legality. How is that possible given that fair labeling comprises part of legality right. via Lex Certa? And then Sachinta Diaz. Hi, Talita. Congratulations on the book. No relation. No relation. No. He could have asked you this at any point in the last five years, but today's the day. <laughs> My question is not related to the subject matter, but for any PhD researchers who are watching you and are no doubt inspired by you, could you say a brief word about the challenges you faced? formulating, clarifying your research question and writing out the thesis and having it published and how you overcame them. Perhaps your top piece of advice for researchers to overcome a major hurdle at one of these stages. Thank you. <laughs> you just, you read it. Yeah, no, thank you. So Richard, um, I'm actually, to be very honest with you, I'm, I'm a bit depressed 
about the, the, the future, you know, the, the outlook of international criminal justice, just because, um, you know, the, the, we've seen a, a, a um, consistent lack of support. We've seen a lot of criticism vis-a-vis um, -vis the ICC. We've seen, and we've seen some, some terrible decisions I have to say, by, by the ICC, as well as other uh, international criminal tribunals, including on this very issue, right, over the years. Decisions which I've, which I've mentioned, decisions that I uh, address in the book. So um, I, I'm, yeah, after finishing the book, I was, I was, very, I was very depressed, <laughs> you know. Um, but I'm now, I'm a, I'm a little bit optimistic just because in the, um, in the past few years, there are signs that the ICC is actually trying harder to, um, to step out of its bubble, if you will, right? It's, it's trying harder to engage with international law more generally. So the problem for me was that these international criminal tribunals tended to be you know, self-contained, very isolated. You know, they, they lived in their own silences and, and, and the rest of the world didn't matter as long as they were doing their own thing. Um, and we saw a lot of inconsistent decisions, you know, uh, a lot of fragmentation between you know, the field of international criminal law and, and other fields of international law. Uh, but I think that, you know, looking at more recent decisions, there, there's, some, there's some sign of optimism, but generally I'm a little bit depressed with the project just because um, I think, um, you know, uh, the ICC and other uh, international institutions that deal with the issue of international criminal justice, they need to think more. They need to think more about the values that the project embodies. They need to, they need to be less blind about political realities. And we saw this in, in, the, in the context of Afghanistan, right? We saw this in the context of other, uh, of other cases, Myanmar. I think that, you know, uh, prosecutors and judges tend to be very sort of like, focused on, you know, just the law, applying the law, and, you know, that's it, very technical. And they tend to forget that we're actually dealing with, you know, normative issues, heavily normative uh, issues. And, and, and also the IC is navigating through a, a very controversial political landscape. And sometimes being indifferent to those issues undermines the whole project, right? So it's kind of like, it's, it's, a, difficult, it's a difficult sort of like line to thread but it's one that it's unescapable, right? And my problem is that, you know, these tribunals have been, have been blind to, to these realities. And, and I always think that, you know, you need to be doctrinal, not doctrinal, you need to be, you need to be technical, you need to be, you know, um, diligent in your work, but you also can't ignore the, real, the political realities in the field, right? So this is why I'm, I'm a bit depressed about the whole project. But, and I see the future of international criminal law as being in the, not in the hands of the ICC, actually, because the ICC is, you know, doesn't have universal support and key players still don't support the court. So I see it in the hands of, of domestic courts, right? I see, I think that the ICC has a role to play, an important one, but it's not the universal court that it was once thought to be right, or or, or that it really, um, or, or the or the, the it, it isn't the universal court that a lot of people envisaged it to be at the beginning, right? And we need to debunk this conception because it, it the reality is it isn't universal and it can't take up all cases because it's limited in resources anyway, right? So this is my my take on the question about uh, uh, legal recharacterization of facts and fair labeling. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, fair labeling, I argue in the book that fair labeling overlaps with legality insofar as it, um, it, it covers situations where labels are applied retroactively, right? So this is how I, I, I argue that fair labeling is sort of like, um, it overlaps or is included within the concept of legality because it addresses the, 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 rec, the um, retroactive application of labels. Lex, Lex Serta is not exactly the same thing as, as fair labeling actually. Uh, so um, Lex Serta is about, um, is about specificity of the criminal law, right? 
of course, that fair labeling in trying to ensure that labels are, are, are specific to some extent, it overlaps to, to like CERTA. But I think the two things are separate. I think we need to distinguish between the two. So, so fair labeling is not necessarily, as I said, not necessarily about choosing the more specific label. Sometimes the more specific label is the right one, but sometimes it isn't. So that's, that's the key thing. And so this is why uh, legal, legal uh, recharacterization of facts wouldn't necessarily breach Lex Serta, right? Because it's not necessarily the case that a more specific label is the one that best reflects the criminality of, of, of the accused. Uh, on the question about uh, PhD researchers, uh, the challenges. So I think that <laughs> that's, that's a very, very good question. Um, so there were many challenges uh, in, in um, you know, uh, doing a PhD. First of all, you're on your own. You don't have anyone telling you what to do. Um, you have your supervisor, but sometimes you, you, know, you, you have to do your own thing because your supervisor is not there to, to micromanage you anyway. So that is the main challenge. You're going to say he's not there. Yeah. <laughs> no, but mine. Sorry, Jaffa. Mine was there. But mine was there. So that's the first challenge. You know, you're on your own, and sometimes you doubt your project. Sometimes you don't have support. Sometimes it's 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 really hard to. You're 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 on your own, and sometimes you get so involved in in your own research that you tend to forget. You know that there's a whole world out there that, and and that you know there are all sorts of practical issues. There are all sorts of other issues that are also relevant and you live in your own bubble, right? So that, that, that's the main challenge, your own research bubble. Um, the other challenge I think is that publishing a book, finding a publisher and, and publishing a book is really, really hard, you know, because sometimes as many of you might know, publishers want to, even academic publishers want to be able to publish things that are sellable, right? That have some sort of commercial value to them. So that it is very challenging to turn a, an academic project that is sometimes very theoretical, sometimes very technical into something that is commercially appealing to a publisher. So that is that is the second challenge that I'd say. And the advice, the advice for, for people at that stage in their careers that I'd give is to, you know, um, to try and when putting together a book proposal, try and highlight the aspects of the book that are sellable that try and pitch it in a more sort of like commercial way or in a way that would be appealing to different audiences. It's not easy to do that, but you, you, you need to be strategic if you want your, your book to be published. And I struggled a lot with this um, and, 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 my, and, and putting together my own proposal because at the time there wasn't any ICC case dealing with, my, uh, with the issue uh, that I've just presented now. Uh, thankfully, there is one now, and thankfully, uh, you know, uh, well, there is a situation of Ukraine that uh, is now under investigation, and so hopefully, Karen Kam will buy my book. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, it will be appealing uh, to him. Uh, so, but yeah, it, it is challenging. But I would say is try and try and pitch, um, try and highlight the, the the more practical issues that you have in your research uh, that make it more appealing to, to practical audiences and to a wide range of, 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 of audiences. That's what I'd say. Thanks, yeah. Sweet. Other questions in the room or online? Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Shashank. I'm from India. I'm an acad academic visitor to Oxford. So firstly, kudos to you for this wonderful work. Thank uh, you. you. You've, you've, I'm sure you would have dealt with the concept of fair labeling. So, uh, and essentially, labeling is generally, and you refer to it that it's, it's done by prosecutors or the judges in, 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 a, in a fair trial. But in this day and age of, of social media, and you know, when, when an incident takes place, you have the media jumping in. And in India, we see this a lot. You know, media trials start, whereas the, the, the formal court trial takes years and years to you know, kind of conclude. So, there is a lot of labeling which takes place. From the side of the media and obviously there could be vested interests so how do you think that uh, kind of impinges upon the, the whole concept of fair labeling does it does it uh, you know uh, inform the uh, the outcome of the uh, of the whole entire fair labeling process when it goes through the the, the the formal trial process absolutely so thank you so much for that question so 
I think that, uh, so one of the things that I argue in the book is that uh, labeling is important because of the stigma that it gives rise to, right? So a label, uh, a, the, the whole point of attaching labels to, 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 to criminal conduct is to, 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 to signal to the general public, to different audiences, what kind of reprobation, what kind of stigma, or, how, or to, to what extent a certain individual should be stigmatized. That's the whole point of labels. And so the, the natural result of attaching a label like genocide or crimes against humanity to someone is that this will generate some sort of social stigma, right? And this was even before the age of social media, not with like traditional media. Uh, and so now with social media, we have, what happens is that, um, you know, we have these labels like genocide in the case of the Rohingya situation, uh, genocide in the case of Ukraine, we have these labels being attached, uh, which with a lot more frequency, right, than, than before. Uh, and also we have more individuals uh, um, that are, you know, uh, being, being, being part of this labeling process, right? The, the audience is the scale of the labeling, uh, the, the sort of like social labeling or social stigmatization process is unprecedented. And so the way in which that is factored in is that, okay, so we need to take into account the extent to which a label uh, generates stigma to an individual, right? So, and, and so that process has to be taken into account. And so, for example, if an individual, uh, if an individual is labeled uh, with something out of court, is, if an individual is, if there is an indictment, for example, that labels someone as a genocidaire, that would and that would generate a lot of attention also on social media and and other and other types of media so 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 that that is something that fair labeling should take into account in the sense of okay is it fair to label that person as as a, as a genocide considering the amount of attention that that label will generate these days right so the stigma so the bottom line is that the stigma will be much heavier these days, the stigma that one attaches even before a trial will be a lot heavier today than before. And so prosecutors and judges and, and other, um, and other uh, authorities, they need to be very careful when choosing a certain label, especially a very uh, stigmatizing label, such as a label that, uh, such as, a, as an international crime, for example, um, before actually labeling someone, because that might have consequences on the accused even if that accused is acquitted in the future. So that's how the, the, effect, of the, the, the effect of social media should be taken into account, right? So, and, and also the impact of a conviction, let's say after a conviction that goes on social media. Again, that should be factored in, factored in when considering the impact of a certain label. So that's, that's how, how it plays out. Maybe, maybe can I just add to that on yeah. labeling? So I'm fully with you on dual functions, yeah. social, social function and the, communica the communicator function to the accused yeah. themselves. Something I've wondered about is whether the polity is sufficiently constituted to actually delineate or delineate between different categories of offender. So in the public consciousness, my sense is there's one category, which is convicted in the Hague. Right. And that might cover the most serious order of certain crimes to the failure to punish a, much less grave crime. So when that label reaches public consciousness, isn't there just one category of, you know, essentially war criminal does the work yeah. for across modes and yeah. crimes. And is that just a function of, we just don't have sufficient offense specification, yeah. understanding, but isn't that a systemic problem? No matter what you do, yeah. you will be convicted in the Hague. War criminal. That's it. Yeah. Isn't that the label we're dealing with in public consciousness? Sometimes it is, right? Sometimes it is that label. Uh, and it depends on the audiences that we're talking about. I mean, I think jur jur like within the sort of like journalistic medium, I think that they tend to be a little bit more specific, but I think for the general public, I think that label is enough, right? You know, being convicted in The Hague. And, and the point that, you, that you've mentioned also makes me think about the importance of uh, the jurisdiction, right? So someone being convicted by an international court, right? The label someone uh, convicted by the ICC is different from a label of someone convicted by the court of state X or someone convicted in Argentina for a certain war crime. It's not the same thing. So the stigma arising from, from that kind of conviction is different, right? 
but yeah, absolutely. I think that there is a there is a there is a problem of of um, in the sense of there there's a lack of awareness uh, of the different sort of like um, categories of international crimes that we need to address uh, in, in the public domain. Uh, but even that label of war criminal convicted in The Hague in itself carries with it significant stigma, right? That's what but I'm worried. Yeah. My worry is over stigmatization. It might be a non punishing yeah. commander, so relatively minor mode, yeah. or sui generis, whatever you want to call it, but minor contribution. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm Kirsten Sutherland. I'm um, a visiting fellow with ELAC, but also a barrister who specializes in the ICC. <laughs> Uh, I was just, um, our, our friend in his uh, comment, I was wondering what your what comments you might have about the, the sort of narratives that get a, that are put out by the ICC, recklessly by the prosecutors, we might say, um, just the very fact of being accused by the ICC, and then the impact that has on the um, investigative field, because the narrative becomes entrenched, it spreads like wildfire and certainly. Yeah. It reverberates into the evidence, yeah. and that may well be a very serious uh, trial um, problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that you know, at, 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 from the moment that uh, the prosecutor puts out or uh, issues a warrant of arrest, right, summons to appear, at the moment that that narrative comes out, that shapes the way in which the entire trial will take place, right? I think Kevin, you have written about this, right? how how you know how one theory of um how one mode of liability how one theory of liability shapes the entire the amount of evidence that is put the types of evidence that are presented and how that sticks with with the trial and 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 how difficult it is to change that that ingrained narrative right uh i think that this is a fair a, a fair trial problem but it's also it's also a fair labeling problem too, because, you know, that label sticks too, right? And so it's hard, and, and that, like I said before, even before a conviction, that label already has an effect on the accused, right? And so, like I said, prosecutors need to be very, very careful when, when they choose the, the, the labels, the crimes and the modes of liability, because it, it might be difficult to change and the impact on the accused might be irreversible. Right. And yeah, so I, I completely agree with you that, you know, putting one narrative out changes the whole might affect the whole trial later on. And it might be difficult to, to, to change it subsequently. And that is a labeling issue, too. OK, thank you. Uh, my name is Hala from I'm a postdoc research at the Benavar Institute. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the achievement. Um, my question is. Okay, yeah, it, let have been said about labeling and my question, I will ask about labeling anyway. So I'm not an international law expert, so forgive me if my question is too naive. Uh, when you say um, labeling matters in international law and you speak uh, language, uh, I understand the, the potential impact of uh, labeling, but my question is how easy is, for example, for the public or for experts like yourself to draw the line between different labeling? Uh, I'll give you an, uh, a practical example. Uh, there is uh, a genocide war happening yeah. in Ethiopia, and an inter the International Commission of Experts on Ethiopia they released a report recently, and they conclude that they have a reasonable ground that crimes against humanity and war crimes is committed, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, rape as uh, was used as a weapon of war starvation of uh, use it as a weapon of war. And they have this uh, phrase with the intent to destroy the Tigrayan ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So we believe this is genocide, but their conclusion is, is war crime and crimes in, in, uh, against humanity. And when you say that labeling matters international, this is, is, strikes, but okay, there is a problem then here. So how do we draw the line between the different labels, even though we understand the potential impact of it? That's very good because one of the challenges of, of you know applying labels in the international context is that sometimes there is like the, they're at the same level like of, of gravity, right? So if you talk about, and a lot of people have tried to make a distinction between a hierarchy, they've tried to put together a hierarchy between international crimes, like basically saying that genocide was the more serious one, 
followed by crimes against humanity, then, then war crimes, and then aggression. So some people have tried to put together a hierarchy of international crimes. I don't agree with that view. But uh, on the flip side, it makes it harder for us to kind of like compare different labels in terms of gravity and in terms of effects on the accused, right? So um, what I would say is that um, from the perspective of the accused, uh, the, 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 ca the categories of crimes, of international crimes, applying one or the other wouldn't necessarily be more stigmatizing, right? Applying war crimes as opposed to crimes against humanity would not necessarily be more stigmatizing on the accused, right? However, within these different broad categories of core international crimes, there are underlying acts that differ in terms of gravity between themselves. So for example, you have rape and you have sexual assault. These, there's a difference in terms of, of, of gravity there, right? Uh, you've got murder and, uh, and you've got, or, or killing, uh, and you've got um, um, manslaughter, for example, right? Uh, you've got torture and then you've got other inhumane acts. So, so you have some level of differentiation within these categories and then the gravity there varies, right? And so for the accused, that matters, right? More than the, 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 cate the broad categories of, 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 of crimes against humanity. From a general perspective, uh, choosing the right label uh, and also from the perspective of the accused and fair labeling, Choosing the right label uh, matters because these different crimes have different elements and they convey different uh, values, right? They, they, have, they protect different interests. And so this is why choosing the right label matters, right? So even though the crime, one crime is not necessarily more serious than the other, um, and this is something that needs to be, uh, you know, uh, highlighted because, for example, a lot of victims get upset when the, the crimes that were committed against them are not labeled in a certain way. So for example, many Rohingya people would be disappointed if, if the offenses against the Rohingya were not labeled as genocide. But actually crimes against humanity is, is, is as serious as genocide, right? But the value of, 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 of you know, picking the appropriate label lies in making sure that we reflect the, the interests that are at, at stake in that particular situation. So is the situation, for example, in the case of the Rohingya, is the situation of the Rohingya one where, you know, the, the value of human diversity or, uh, is, is, is at stake? You know, are, are, are the offenses that are occurring in Myanmar against the Rohingya offenses that threaten the existence of a group? Or are they offenses that threaten the existence of individuals without necessarily there being a protected racial, religious, national, uh, or ethnic group, right? So that is the value of labeling, of picking the label that best reflects the criminality. And then the issue of, of, of gravity is, is another one that is uh, more important for the accused. But on a general level, it, we want to be able to, 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 to label these, these events accordingly so that we, so that the, the, we express, so that the, the, the law expresses the values that it was meant to express, if that makes sense. Labels are meant to communicate values. And so we want to make sure that international criminal law communicates the right values to all relevant stakeholders. So that's why labels import, are important in that, in that context. I was in a college meeting today where it was disclosed that if any meeting in the college goes for more than two hours, it has to be catered. <laughs> I didn't know that was a rule, but it's apparently it is a rule. We're not quite there yet. It just falls me forced to me to say first thank you so much to Davika and to Kevin for your insightful comments. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for coming and I will give the final word to Talita. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone who took the time to be here. Um, again it's it's such a real pleasure um, uh, to be talking about this book um, and um, and to be sharing my this achievement with all of you and thank you again to Davika and to Kevin for for their comments. Um, which I, I really appreciate. And uh, I'll take it on board when, when, when continuing to write about these issues, because as I've said, these issues are now, uh, you, know, um, you know, heating up again uh, before the ICC. And so hopefully there's, there's gonna be room for more discussion. 
uh, about this and and hopefully um yeah we can exchange more ideas about about this and and, and hopefully we can make sure uh, with our uh, advocacy and with our scholarship we can make sure that the ICC and other international criminal tribunals take these issues seriously as they should have from the beginning so that's that's how how, how I would end this discussion thank you so, Dapo, do you want to say something no. <laughs> All I wanted to say is we haven't hit two hours yet, but there is catering of sorts. So there's a drinks reception outside. So if you can stay for some wine and some nibbles, please do so. Um, thank you. Have a glass of wine for all of us that are yeah. wrapped in Real cyberspace. Okay. Can't wait for the second edition to later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, Tabika. Thanks, Kevin. Nice to see you both. Nice see, to see you. Thank you so guys. much. Yeah, thank you so you. much again. Cheers. I'm like, my voice is. I'm going to go right there. Yeah. Yeah.